Hello everyone, today we talked about the Iberian monarchies during the 13th century. Also a general look at the, the broader picture. Then we'll keep making in-depth in videos dedicated to you know, the more specific topics. It's important to make these broader assessments. If anything, I've noticed that people tend to watch this content more um, and then, then even the, the most detailed one. So uh, I presume it's, it's, it's useful as also there are many uh, subscribers that haven't uh, followed since the beginning and I obviously interpret and reinterpret things the more I go on and develop, you know, other perspectives and, uh, you know, and theoretically improve my own my own understanding of certain dynamics so many dynamics in fact that when we talk history we know will pop out uh, continuously right always there is no such a thing like a single topic that is settled there is always something new to say independently from historiography and what you know of course the new acquisitions uh, show us by themselves we can start from July the 16th, 1195, when the Almohad Caliph Abu Yusuf Yaqub al-Mansur, al-Mansur, right, uh, one of the most famous figures of the Islamic Middle Ages, had defeated the Castilian king Alfonso VII in the great pitch battle of Alarcos. We will talk about that battle specifically. Um, only eight years had passed since the defeat at Hapton uh, and the Muslim capture of, of Jerusalem, right? So it was um, a difficult moment for Christendom, um, even though, you know, the, the broader expansion of, of the Frankish world, of, you know, Western Christendom was, was evident at so many levels. Still, the Muslim uh, powers... Uh, in the Mediterranean, in Europe, we're, we're still active and dangerous, right? And so this coming back, especially of the Almohad power, was troubling the, you know, the, the broader projects of, of Christianity. And in fact, the new Pope, Innocent III, that at this point was resuming a, a great struggle, not just against the infidels, but properly from within the, the, against the heretics, Right against the anarchy, the disorder was spreading uh, in Europe at that time. Um, was well decide, uh, decided to maintain under control at least the situation in the Iberian Peninsula. In the Near East, the uh, the games were kind of over. Right, that there could be naturally the, the maintenance of uh, some some strongholds, etc. But uh, until a uh, a great, a new great crusade had been launched, right? In that situation against a major power like Egypt, there was no mm, momentary possibility to to stem the Muslim advance. Those lands and the the, the loss of Jerusalem had uh, consistently brought to the end of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, as we uh, as as it had been known at that point. We made videos about this. We made a video about the Battle of Aten its tactical reconstruction in detail um, and we and and of course the uh, resumption the coming back of uh, Islamic power in the Iberian Peninsula was was uh, in a sense part of a broader strategy that when we think of um, let's say Christendom versus Christianity versus Islam in, in these um, in these times we tend to say legitimately, when correctly, like that there wasn't like a real, uh, it wasn't a real dichotomy, right? There were many intersections and coexistences and so on. And the same reconquista actually would bring to that, right? Because after Las Namas, as we will see now, uh, the Christians could have easily gotten rid of Muslim presence uh, in the Iberian Peninsula right away. Instead, you know, other more than, you know, almost three 300 years would pass before that would happen. That was a matter of, of convenience, but we don't have to underestimate the, um, you know, the, the, the broader coordination of, of powers, especially at this time, that as we've seen in uh, recent videos, were, were soaked into properly universalistic ideas 
uh, at many levels in uh, in many countries many powers in this moment of uh, of expansion of the the major the major polities independently from the the balance in that was being shifted say uh, dramatically in favor of of uh, of Christendom but that fundamentally still from from the Islamic side was was being lived as you know a broader struggle right uh, about, about le yes in, in a less coordinated way but um, still symbolically so I mean Alarcos came in fact to be recognized quite clearly as a connected to Hatton in, in the in the broader process so a lot of uh, you know backs and forth in this in this balance of course like in you know mm, struggles and especially uh, some of such large scale and uh, you know with the means of the time by the way that we're definitely making such processes happen gradually right so uh, the the international coordination of, of, of the Roman Church especially uh, guided by the Roman Church was uh, is one of the most important and overlooked aspects of med in medieval history Right, many people wonder what what actually the papal function was in general, and and the things that the Roman Church achieved in the Middle Ages are uh, nothing short but you know extraordinary. Um, in in a world that didn't didn't and, and quite couldn't even in other universal um, uh, references such as the the empire itself coordinate itself. Uh, I mean, you feel a, a broader uh, you know follow a, a broader um, you know, authority to the sovereign, uh, an over lordship, let's say, that would tell them what, what to do. So, there were naturally also local interests. For example, north of the Pyrenees, the Aquitanians uh, that uh, had made vow to, uh, to leave as crusaders for the Holy Land were authorized to commute their own vow in an Iberian expedition by the papacy uh, the, the 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 southern French in this and properly the Occitanians were uh, were interested of course in, in Iberian politics for many reasons at this point as, as you know the the northern France was about to recover a dramatic power properly as a, as a kingdom and they they legitimately um, uh, wanted to and they, they feared such such interference that in a few decades would bring actually to the to the conquest of of Occitania at the hand of the um, of the French nobility, and so looking at what was happening in the Iberian Peninsula, where they also had you know, important allies and significant ties, also culturally speaking, etc. Um, they they needed to you know to to support the this the Christian establishment there and to in, in order to receive uh, further support from them against against the north uh, so there was a great participation to the Christian coming back in in in, in the Iberian Peninsula from the side of properly foreign enemies Frankish enemies um, there, there was a further success scored by the Almohads uh, with the conquest of the castle of Salvatierra in 1210 that induced the Pope to launch a new crusade that was preached in fact also in France so we will we will look uh, at this in you know in other videos more in detail but we're talking about the the campaign of Las Navas famously enough to which participated um, the the kings Alfonso VIII of Castilla Peter uh, uh, of Aragon the the chivalric orders of Santiago, Alcantara, and Calatrava that were born in, in Spain expressly for the clash against the Muslims. Many, of course, Sp Spanish, Portuguese, and Southern French knights. And in a second phase, also Sancho of Navarre. So, um, the, 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 the amount of, of troops deployed was, was enormous, right? On July the 17th, 1212, the expedition was concluded with a great Christian victory of Las Navas de Tolosa, immediately, uh, you know, uh, downstream of the passes 
uh, of uh, the Sierra Morena between Castilla and Andalusia. So this is a major event, right? The, the single most important one after the capture of, of Toledo. Uh, and essentially it opened the Christians, the gates of the south, right? The rich and splendid region of uh, Andalusia and it preluded to the fall of the same capital of the Almohad Caliphate, Cordoba, was most important, it had remained the seat of the, of the Caliphate from, from centuries, which in fact was conquered in 1236 by King Ferdinand III, the Saint of Castile, 1217-1252. And at Ferdinand's death, um, it, it objectively could be said that the Reconquista could had had been had been fulfilled in a sense, had been accomplished, right? Because uh, these lands were fundamentally the, the core ones of 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 Islamic power since uh, since the Islamic conquest of of the Iberian Peninsula. It wasn't over, as we were saying before, but the major blow had been given. Castilla had profited the largest from this, as it had been also the power had been fundamentally more involved, at least continentally, uh, in, in in the struggle against the Muslims, um, the um, the Kingdom of Portugal. We made a, a video about uh, its development a couple of months ago. Was recognized by the Pope in 1179. Right, this b before the County of Portugal was essentially considered as part of the Saint Castille, um, in, in a way, and uh, this new power uh, tended to the colonization of the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula, the area of the so-called Algarve that had been in fact contended between uh, not just with the Muslims but with the Castilians themselves and would be a matter of attrition between the two kingdoms um, for, for, for quite a while. Um, and uh, the Castilians had seized the area south of the river uh, Guadalquivir except for the uh, mostly civilized but small emirate of Granada entrenched in, in the southern mountains that as a, as a fortress state that would have remained Muslim in fact up to the, the famous siege of 1492 quite of a symbolic date also for the same Iberian discovery of, of the Americas and the um, so a big a big deal in terms of really of a, it's as if a dam had been broken right from that, uh, from that great victory, but still, you know, uh, after all, uh, a limited military event like Las Navas, the, the entire Islamic presence in in uh, you know the Iberian Peninsula had been shattered and overwhelmed. Uh, finally, uh, after in fact centuries of struggles, as we know, uh, um, in crumbling under the slow gradual but r still relentless pressure of the Christian kings of the, uh, uh, kingdoms of the north that as we've seen actually received an important deal of support from from continental Europe from 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 the papacy uh, the, the French presence here is very important right what happened uh, from you know strictly concrete uh, from, from a strictly concrete point of view is that uh, the the opening of, of these lands to to Christian penetration occurred in many areas quite quite o in a very autonomous way, right? You know, you had knights coming literally from everywhere, from places as far as England or or the uh, northern Europe, etc. It would simply, you know, arrive in countries like Portugal, like like Castilla, etc. It would settle as mercenaries, as as adventurers, fundamentally in in the various castles they were autonomously stripping from from the Muslims. The, the rule of which were, ha, had collapsed here, um, and so and contributing to that process, as we will see, of privatization, seniorialization of the land. Naturally, here, you know, we, we know what happened. Like since uh, since the, the, the disgregation of, of the of of the old caliphate, the you know in, in the typhus, the the, the, the broader uh, the, the 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 Islamic state in Spain had gradually lost. Um, any, let's say, any true central capacity of managing unitarily the, the system. There had been, as we've just seen, these uh, 
uh, further waves right, of coming backs of Islamic power of these essentially Berber peoples coming from the Atlas, the uh, Almoravids, the, that by settling Spain gave new length um, to the uh, to, to Islamic powers, but were short-lived fundamentally, as the, 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 the local structures were kind of feudalizing, privatizing a bit as it was happening all over Europe and the Mediterranean at that point. Uh, this is the in part the, the, the broader sense of what, what was happening uh, in, in the world at this point. In, a, you know, in the same years uh, Constantinople had fallen to the Crusades, there had been a, a crisis of Byzantine and Islamic cultures that were essentially successor states of, of, of the Roman Empire in terms of its uh, centralized um, permanent military um, bureaucratic tradition that had fundamentally not withstood uh, traditionally the, uh, the, the the test of time and that had gradually you know this great effort to keeping things together under a single rule with a strong degree of of centralization had eventually collapsed through the autonomization of, of the various lords of the the, the centralized administrative system that uh, in a way especially with this uh, you know growth from 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 the bottom up of, of you know pr pr production and especially vehiculated pioneered managed by the same local lords was a bit the reason why the same west was expanding so so enormously so this had impacted also these other cultures and it wasn't as you understand much of a positive progress in a sense at least I from from the islamic side because um it, it was not coherent with the previous system and so there was a greater cultural resistance to the to the struggle uh, the Barren Peninsula is also very large very diverse very um, articulated in different um, properly territories areas basins climates right so uh, maintaining c nobody had actually ever managed since Roman times to maintain control of the land right the Visigoths um, the the Arabs etc had yes established a center of power at some point but the, the periphery the French had always remained somewhat rebellious and uh, the, the the nature of the land had also um, already been let's say inclined to, towards privatization in many ways that the south Andalusia Andalus was uh, the play the, the the most promising era from you know for for, for the sake of state building it was the richest uh, the, the most fertile to provided even the mineral resources the most urbanized was one of the most radically romanized areas of the whole empire back in the day uh, and, and and of course this was in the far south, right? As rich and powerful as it was, you know, it was practically impossible to to control directly uh, the north. That even at some point, even the the the, the, the Visigothic refugees, the, the Christian states of the north, had had even formally recognized Islamic Islamic uh, overlordship for for saving their skins, but never quite they had been subdued, uh, and no, nor at that point was much of a greater need to to do that right but so the, the 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 collapse gradually occurred because the same northern islamic lords were uh, the northern Iberian islamic lords were 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 more fragmented were had more autonomistic tendencies and they often also sided with the christians um and vice versa also because and so that's why also their conquista took a lot but started from the north to eventually and as the christians managed to turn the tide and, and as this event showed there is a broader uh let's say interpretation of this that passes naturally through the, the idea of a moral dimension of a of a of a new force that had not been revived from the islamic side over the centuries if not for these semi-nomadic populations that would arrive uh, cyclically to reinject again new warlike uh, fanatic uh, you know, motivation and and capacity, but um, they were also something very different from from the Iberian culture, right? And its its advancements and what what it 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 had also benefited from in a sense from this prolonged struggle between Christians and Muslims. Iberian warfare, uh, and especially during the High Middle Ages, seems to have been much more advanced than it's often credited for. Uh, even in comparison to the countries like France or Italy that for that matter pioneered the, the, what we see as the, the Western kind of Frankish um, warfare in, in many ways from, you know, in, uh, 
heavy cavalry, uh, missile weapons, uh, and military engineer. But in 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 Spain, there, there are many features that uh, also in in armor, you know, in in in, in technology broadly meant that, that are objectively imposing and tell stories that the Iberian Peninsula was probably not able to tell because of the of the very peculiar uh, cultural. Mm, let's say, combination that was occurring there. Um, the, the Muslim world, yes, was more, let's say, w was richer in Spain, uh, but it, at the same time wasn't so culturally, um, let's say, prolific, right, in terms of representation, sources, etc., than, than eventually what the, the West was systematizing in, in the Frankish world. So um, we often know less than we would like to. Also, the and the following Christian, uh, you know, the, the the Christian powers that took over these areas weren't particularly, in fact, having remained in the north mostly in a pastoral mentality and essentially feudal, one would wouldn't develop themselves a particularly, um, you know, uh, you know, eloquent uh, historiography or you know even the it was different from the one it was developing in other countries. With a due exceptions, of course, and I'm talking mostly about the cont continental Iberian Peninsula. Um, but uh, as we will see, th this balance was um, was was going in favor of the of the uh, of the Christians. The the long years of the clash against the Muslims had deeply marked the. Uh, the cultural character, especially of Castilla, this is evident also in Portugal, and also in other, like in Aragon, or even in Navarre, etc. The, the the mark, the the print of um, um, austere and uh, warlike religiosity. That this is evidence even in the you know in, in the Iberian art and right, architecture and stuff properly. It's heavy, right? It's it's loaded. It's 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 really mm, severe in a sense. It it, it does um, represent this this uh, s continuous uh, th th this idea of existential idea of struggle that goes on. It was a victorious one. This is also very important in uh, in perspective for for the way it developed as opposed to other countries that have also, especially in Central Eastern Europe, this idea of martyrdom, right? But that, that however was well, so in, in the orthodox world especially but that eventually succumbed right so the, the, there is an idea almost of detachment cognitive dissonance uh, the, the warlikeness of the Iberian monarchies instead was maintained especially in the continent uh, the continental ones quite strongly in a, only in a vision of the world that was also spent later on especially during the early modern age in any case there is all a historiographical debate relatively to the outcome of the Reconquista in terms of we could even say of, of quality of life uh, that observes how the the Christian conquest didn't actually mark the, uh, the the start of a particularly positive season that is to say uh, this is an extreme the, the extreme view then we will look at the opposite of it that is to say in the rough half millennium of uh, of, of Islamic rule of Iberian lands that the, the Muslims had made certain uh, areas of uh, this region say a garden of lands right that were by their own nature desertic such as the arid highland of the uh, meseta and they had brought their water by um, by mean of uh, you know remarkable right and bold almost work of um, irrigation they had started their uh, cereal, sugar cane, citrus cultivation. Um, and it's been observed how also in, in the populous Islamic cities governed, uh, the, the, you know, let's say many cities governed by the Muslims, uh, the Christian so-called Mo Mozarabic communities that used uh, currently Arab in their liturgy and the Hebraic ones had lived in harmony, right? And uh, also a urban uh, class of merchants and artisans had developed. While the sovereigns of Castile, backed by a, a feudal aristocracy of knights, 
whose economic interests were uh, tied more with the uh, the primitive pastoral activity didn't have uh, an interest to maintain such civil levels of life. Um, so, for example, agriculture wasn't encouraged particularly, nor the artisans, the you know, the, the commerce, right? They, they, on the contrary, the new um, rulers contributed to obstacle uh, such activities by uh, persecuting uh, the Muslims and the Jews that were the the backbone of it, right? So Castilla was. Uh, in this sense, um, destined to become uh, a desolated land of poor shepherds, of you know miserable agricultures, and of a nobiliar class devoid of means and characterized by a, a lifestyle inspired by warlike values and um, a religiosity that was indeed felt as a as a clash against the infidels. So this. This is the picture, if you want a dark one, that one can trace about Castilla in a sense. And it is true that Spain, uh, given it, that this, this potential, wasn't a particularly, you know, especially in the continental areas, wasn't particularly, you know, there were a few people, after all. Uh, there were not dramatic, um, I don't know, industrial developments like in other centers. Even though there were cities, there were, you know, connections, etc., of course. Uh, it was a more more of a continental uh, system, right? The the Barren Peninsula was also fundamentally cut um, from from any of you. You have basically the sea from all sides except from the north, when you have the, the mountains, and then you have Africa in the south. So Castilla is the very heartland, and so by itself, it's not particularly open, like I don't know Flanders or Italy to or, or the same Aragon and, and Catalonia, mostly Catalonia actually, to. To, to, to sea trade, to even just to international relations, per se. Um, at the same time, though, um, the, um, let's say, the, the Castilian style development was the strongest, most robust one, right, the most orderly one. This, this, this thing could be argued even about France altogether. France was much richer in many ways, much larger, but, um, let's say, the the idea that w it's it's mostly a political thing, right? It's the idea that the king maintains the upper hand, right, on on the the, com the communities, right, and man manages to channel them into this feudal hierarchy through which state building was was launched, right, with the co-optation of the higher nobility, and so the great power of the lay and uh, ecclesiastical lords of the kingdom. Because see in this sense, succeeded to become the largest power in the Iberian Peninsula. So yes, it wasn't particularly dynamic uh, internally, especially compared to, to, to the crown of Aragon, but uh, it still was the not just the greatest power, but also probably the one with the greatest, not just in potential, but in practice, because the, 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 the monarchy had, a, a, for, medieval, by, for medieval standards, a very strong grip on the community in itself. Right, the king had a great power, and was habituated to use it as such. Right, something that, for example, in the crown of Aragon, you know, would always be impossible to do. Right, it was mostly like a confederacy where, which, are, uh, you know, the various chunks of of of, uh, of the crown that made up territorially of this this uh, dominion were essentially autonomous. Right, there wasn't even a, a close coordination, even in the expansion in the Mediterranean. It was much more uh, search for autonomy. And uh, sometimes even independent policy. Uh, while Castille was the one that effectively would lead the path to for for the fact of the, you know, the the, the creation of the, of modern Spain, right, would take over even culturally, linguistically the, you know, the the uh, with the, the crown of Aragon. Even though the unification properly in a, in a single state wouldn't come, but it's in centuries and centuries because actually the the union of Castilla and Aragon in fact was just a dynastic union it was not actually a uh, an end of the two monarchic entities on the contrary this would be a problem for Spain uh, in, in inside but at, at the same t and, and it does 
yeah, it does talk about if, if you want of a kind of a more traditional, you know, primitive state making than that it was going on in other areas of Europe. But at the same time, we're talking about a, a large amount of resources, right? It doesn't matter whether in relative terms they were comparatively stagnating, like when the the unity of Castilla and Aragon in in the 15th century would occur. Spain was factually a, an enormous power because still for for those times summing all the resources of of Spain uh, uh, w was was really you know a, a huge country that uh, just you know France fundamentally could compare with. And in fact, the struggle would occur in Italian wars what was effectively between these two powers. Um, and then all naturally the primate of the uh, of the explorations, the the the, the hands that were a uh, you know the, the they were able to to put on the on on the American uh, precious metals and all these things. So it was a hell of a power, right? And Castilla had managed to fundamentally call coalize it to make to coalesce it first of all, and then to consolidate it under this strong monarchic rule. So yes, it is true, right? To to be completely honest about in terms of the desolation of of the uh, of the Iberian plateau and etc. There is to stress the fact that the Reconquista itself had contributed to render those lands kind of infertile, and uh, simply because you know in a frontier that 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 lasts for hundreds of years, you just communities are mostly obviously going to invest mostly in chattel, not in sedentary. Uh, activities because such as agriculture of course because the situation is so unstable and it's so easy actually you know raiding uh, was you know in the Iberian Peninsula it was fairly easy to, to achieve in spite of all these this, this because there are very wide plains areas plateaus etc in spite of the, of the difficulty of uh, besieging and you know storing all the various strongholds that rise over these these plateaus etc um, but um, so it, it was a land that uh, even just historically hadn't probably been best suited for for that since for, from a long time, right? It was mostly the South that enjoyed this very important, uh, you know, benefits coming also from the opening to the seas itself. The same, cor the same thing about Seville that became at this point took off, right? Especially with the Genoese presence for the Castilians who properly become also effectively a naval power even though they weren't quite um, uh, they weren't quite uh, you know mar maritime in, you know minded um, people but let's say it's the sheer size and especially the political cohesion of the kingdom that made it made the success of it that you would see and in fact it's striking from the other side to compare Castilla with with the crown of Aragon because um, this this was a if you want a completely different land, uh, especially in the coastal areas that were effectively the ones that made the the wealth of, of, of the king. Um, in 1137, the, properly the kingdom of Aragon, that is, is said, like, it's a bit like more Castile, right? It's a continental area, uh, was united, however, with the, the county of Catalonia, the origins of which dated back to the time of Charlemagne, you know, with the Spanish mark, you know, and uh, corresponded to the uh, to the historical in fact territory of Catalonia that was that is located between the the eastern extremity of the Pyrenees and the sea. So Catalonia had brought to the severe uh, the the the, uh, the stern Aragonese uh, milieu that that was as we were saying more similar to the continental kind of pastoral like communities of Castille um, the the gift if you want of the lively and fresh forces constituted by the coastal cities the Catalan culture and language were very close to the Occitanian ones so more or less corresponding to the uh, the French uh, today's French areas is south of the Loire, and it's something that you can easily perceive, and even if you visit those places, frankly, you can breathe kind of a Spanish atmosphere when when you I don't know you are you go to Carcassonne or Toulouse. It, it, it's 
it's it's part of that kind of uh, Visig Visigothic bridge that had remained across the Iberian Peninsula and, and Gaul uh, that hadn't been cancelled, but actually reinforced by Arab, you know, influence, culture, and so on. And uh, it's it's magic in its in its own way, um, but. Um, in even more properly, Catalonia formed by you know an entity on its own, right? This distinguished both from the Hispanic Christian world dominated by the Castilian language and the properly the French one, the the Gallic one across the Pyrenees, by some sort. And especially we're talking about coastal cities. This is um, and of course of Barcelona, that was one of the most florid Mediterranean ports. It's a splendid city inhabited by uh, merchants and sailors endowed with, with a great entrepreneurial mind, which is, you know, in the case of any maritime center provided with such degree of, of independence, uh, it, it's something hardly connected with anything, even d closing land of, of some you know, tens of miles, right? You know, if you look even at the, I don't know, at the Italian maritime republics, you understand that the main interests of the city-states were fundamentally to stay alone, right? Barcelona was framed naturally within uh, a larger system, but in itself, right, the culture is 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 itself, right? It's coastal, it's the projection toward the sea, it's, it's not looking at the interland, per se. Um, in fact, Catalan economy had its own basis, on the sea, in trade, mm -hmm. and uh, such trade uh, prevailed during the 13th century. While basically every each one of these communities w was expanding, right? The the Kingdom of Aragon was expanding, continuing the Reconquista along the eastern coast of the Iberian Peninsula occupying the beautiful and fat cities of Valencia and Murcia. And between 1229 and 1235, also the Balearic Islands were taken. Um, these were, were the, the first element of that future was being called properly, maybe excessively, but properly Mediterranean Empire. Uh, under the Aragonese um, that uh, would have included starting from 1302 also Sicily and um, from 1328 also Sardinia. Um, so it, it's a different channel, it's a different path, mo very different from the one of Castilla. In, in all this I would like to continue actually what I was saying before um, uh, to precise one thing that is to say um, the, the this expansion had occurred at the, uh, as we've seen, at the damage of the Islamic rule. That, conversely, in spite of that, a bit stereotypical wealth and you know advancement and technological you know uh, capacities and so on was was, however, less uh, articulated. Than the West, right? When we were saying before, ah, you know, the the the, the Arabs had brought sugar cane, water, uh, where there was desert, the you know, laws of it. This is this is true, right? This is true, especially in the early age of the Islamic conquest. Um, it, but at the same time, as as I also was saying even before, the, the, there wasn't kind of a glue that had managed to keep this thing together. Yes, there were large cities, but they were not so uh, active so um, uh, autonomous, so uh, um, organized, like the ones that were rising in, in the West, right? Um, this is proven by the same Reconquista, it's proven by the, even the same maritime capacities of, 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 the, of Christians, right? The Reconquista had started in the 11th century in the same lands on the eastern coast, uh, with, uh, you know, the peasants and the Genoese supporting the, the Iberian land forces against, in order to storm the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Muslim strongholds. And um, so even those, you know, the, 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 the religious coexistence, yes, this, this had happened, had been a, a clever way of, you know, administering the thing. And it's obvious that the Christians would kind of start oppressing the, uh, the Islamic and, and Jewish communities after they you know, they had essentially secured their own control on the land, because if you can have a, a unitary uh, 
uh, ideology that can support your own cause. You, you will do it, especially considering there are still the Muslims in the peninsula. This doesn't mean it's a positive thing, you know, in, in a broader sense. Uh, the repression against the Jews um, or the Muslims was something terrifying in, in, in its extreme consequences. Uh, we made that video about the Mudayar that where we, we talked about how important this same Islamic and, and Jewish militias had been for, for Christian armies in, in, in the struggle for the Reconquista. But as soon as those elements were over. You see, uh, if these communities had been more organized, it had been provided by greater strength to just a mercantile artisan capacity, as it had uh, happening more in, in, in Islamic times, uh, these this, this populations that were very numerous, like the, 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 the Muslim Jewish element in places like even the Kingdom of Aragon was like to a 40% of the population. It was something enormous, right? That also tells you properly how Ideological in nature could uh, must be the, uh, the 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 imposition uh, of of unitary uh, idea uh, of unitary you know faith fundamentally in those lands because they're essentially the same people, right? Yet there is not really an ethnic divide. It was all blended in, and it remained until up until you know 1492 and later. Expo forced conversions and expulsions because the Iberian Peninsula had always been that heavily mixed and blended, right? You know, it's ever since it wasn't just a matter of, of, of the Muslim, uh, uh, you know, in the Berber, say the Arab and the Berber invasion. It, it was a matter properly of how Spain was historically, right? Of these various elements the, 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 the Carthaginians, the Iberians, the, the Celts. The, the Romans, the Greeks, I mean, um, it, it was really um, uh, the Lusitanians, I mean, it, it was really a, a, a very, heavy, then eventually the, 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 the Germanic peoples and so on, the Iranian ones, um, it, it was a, a very diverse line, so in a way, even just to rule it, uh, considering, as we have seen, the extension of it and the difficulties also, the strategic difficulties of finding such lands, in a sense, that, that militaristic nature of Castile was probably the best, was probably, you know, the iron fist that was needed to make sense of this whole thing in a unitary sense. In fact, it's very, it's very important to stress that the northern, the, the Iberian kingdoms of the north that had started the Reconquista since, since the 8th century, uh, surviving the, the, the complete collapse of, of the Visigothic kingdom, um, had never quite stressed the Properly, the Visigothic legacy per se, or any any other kind of ethnic one, they had stressed mostly the Christian one, the absolute Christian identity, over basically any other. And it was, of course, impossible to do otherwise, right? When when the Castilians conquered Toledo, they they proclaimed themselves emperors of the Christians, the Ma in, in, emperors and protectors of Christians, Muslims and Jews alike, right? So uh, it, it was. It couldn't be different because if they hadn't presented itself initially as the protectors of such a huge uh, population like the, the 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 Islamic one and the Jewish one uh, in Spain, they, they wouldn't nev never conquer the land. It's only after they they knock out the the major Islamic uh, polity in 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 the Iberian Peninsula that they could afford to gradually you know oppress and repress and eventually cancel. Uh, the uh, this this religious and cultural diversity. Um, so I, I care about this because um, it as violent as it was hideous as it was it was also corresponding, however, to a very rational, cold and and, and logical iron logical need, right? So we can't we, we have to to properly understand the difficulties of ruling at the time and on such enormous spaces. And again, the Castilian formula by it's so rigid and austere and and and, um, and 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 brutal in a way was probably the best one in order to keep things together right um and and, and it talks for for it speaks for for the castilian success in the in the Bering peninsula overall right uh, as we've seen the 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 eastern coast of spain was populated by much more thriving communities barcelona and the various you know, cities along the coast, um, trade, wealth, etc. But they, they wouldn't accomplish that either because as, as far as they were growing richer, they didn't even care, right? They would just keep 
expanding at sea, which is also risky and or, however, uh, it, it's a sort of um, it's a sort of overlordship of dom dom dominion, domination over lands that also have, however, their own character, right? Um, those lands would never become Spanish as, you know, the the the, the southern, you know, Al uh, the you know the the, the the Andalusia would become, right? We were mostly presence, garrisons, um, you know, of course, under threat of this uh, deterrent. Uh, fleet that the the Aragonese could put together to eventually penetrate these areas, but also in those same lands, autonomy was the key, right? There was no way to rule but through the local oligarchies. Something that in the in the, in the continentally barren uh, scenario well, didn't quite happen, because it was literally a taking over from let's say foreigners in a sense, and as we've seen, all these various lords that settled all almost even autonomously without control of the actual of the monarchs of, of Castile and Portugal to eventually be integrated in the in the system. It was a very hard long process but, but it also happened in a kind of on the long run it was actually framed in an orderly fashion which is which is interesting even in this in this vision right it, it, it's important to have an ideological glue that keeps things together even when it maybe not particularly uh, refined or sophisticated, but still the important is that it's simple, it's clear, it revolves in this case around the the the, the ar around fate, right, and the struggle against uh, the the infidel. And you know, as long as you can go on with that and it works, let it work. Naturally, it's much more than that as well. But speaking especially by the 13th century, don't underestimate how how still primitive that world was, right, especially from the Christian side and, and the capacity it had still in its warlikeness to take over, right, because it that's really key. Then eventually, but in the 14th and 15th century, as we were saying before, all these, all the Iberian monarchies underwent a, a very imposant and important uh, state making, right, that held on, on importantly on the long run. Still, however, imbued with that kind of mentality. And in objectives. Um, so, looking at the the Aragonese dominion in the Mediterranean, it's obvious that such expansion um, uh, concealed some sort of political and social tension. Right, Aragon, as we've seen, uh, land of warlike feudatories and shepherds, uh, was. Um, you know, oriented essentially to the war against the Moors and therefore the the continental affirmation within the Iberian Peninsula, right? In relation, but also competing with the policy of the neighboring kingdom of Castilla. On the contrary, the mercantile and ship uh, building class uh, of Catalonia aimed cl more clearly, in this sense, in their own way, more clearly to maritime policy and thus spotted in the conquests of the Mediter of the western mediterranean islands in the, in the relation with other maritime powers in the 13th century in the same area so essentially genoa and pisa the most auspicable um, lines of the future aragonese presence in the european and mediterranean context right so the m catalan merchants settled stably in the ports of Sicily uh, after the Vespers revolt that had been backed by their own king. Um, you know what the broader picture was, the Angevins, um, uh, we were talking about it yesterday, so essentially Charles of Anjou, the brother of the Louis the IX, whose father had actually died in, in you know, attempting to recover from 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 Aragon against Aragon in battle, so um, uh, the the those lands at the border, in fact, in the part in the Pyrenees, that uh, that makes you understand how uh, Aragon had necessarily to to intervene against any French uh, expansion in the Mediterranean, and in that sense, they uh, Charles of Anjou was as king of Sicily was about to launch. An expedition that would have reconquered Constantinople quite easily, 
and therefore added even and basically reunited east and west once for all where even the germans had failed etc instead the vespers backed by the paleologoi of constantinople and aragon brought to this sicilian revolt that essentially welcomed the aragonese uh, invasion and landing in the island that took over in you know essentially the, the same from 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 the from the angevins and that was in fact um becoming the center of a um, of a aragonese monarchy a new one properly subjected to frederick brother of james the second of aragon uh, confirmed by the treaty, so-called treaty was a series of ones of Caltabellota in 1302. So this is interesting because the Aragonese at that point technically became kings of Sicily, because in, in the Angevins too, the Angevins were actually ruling from Naples, differently from the Swabians that had centered mostly in, in, in Palermo. Sicily had declined objectively from late Swabian times and uh, and also during the Angevins that in fact had shifted they, they wanted to be closer to Rome they had different interests also in central Italy and intervening also in the north um, and and thus you know the Aragonese kingdom of Sicily wasn't this great power like especially because it was now the, the old kingdom of Sicily in half right the Angevins themselves kept from Naples the title of kings of Sicily because object from an institutional point of view that's what they were right independently from where they ruled it wasn't important so there was this query we will make a video about this a split for which no side was eager to abandon the idea that they were nominally kings of the wall kingdom so Sicily plus m mainland southern Italy and they kept struggling for generations until essentially in, in for a very long time, actually, up to the mid 15th century, when the Aragonese properly invaded Naples after the Angevins had sharply declined. But at this point, actually, in during the 13th century, the beginning of 14th, the the major power by far was Naples, right? Uh, in, except they tried over and over again to launch, uh, to reconquer Sicily with major uh, uh, expeditions, some of the largest actually happening in in medieval Europe um, at that time, uh, and that always fail and and so Sicily wasn't again more than much and what what is interesting though is that as we were saying before all these various territories right such as this Sicilian king weren't like uniformly under Aragonese rule F fundamentally they were all separated kingdoms right having a broader interest because their competitors were natural competitors of theirs the Angevins as we've seen also in the broader European politics the Genoese that were backing the the, the Angevins themselves and that were competing with the Catalonian merchants or but still you know as always com trading with them then if at some point the uh, you know the, the Aragonese kings would confiscate all their goods so the Genoese would retaliate and part of the reason why the 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 Emirate of Cordoba uh, of uh, of Granada remained for so long is also that the Genoese began to to directly support it to back it against against Aragon and, and, and this back and forth, this ballet, uh, that was normal. But in, in the meanwhile, there were times in which properly the king of Sicily, even though they were always the same, from the same family, the kings of Aragon, they would pursue uh, a policy that sometimes was even in, in contrast with the one of Aragon. Sometimes they allied themselves with, I don't know, the pope. There were, there were these ambiguous, uh, because mostly the Aragonese were a Ghibelline power, right? They being anti French, they mostly sided also against the papacy, but sometimes the papacy also needed to detach a bit itself more from the French. So there were also this, all these back and forth. There was no f such thing like a unified Aragonese rule in, in, this, in this sense. And frankly, as we were saying before, those kingdoms had been ruined in part by the same, you know, successions because every time a new dynasty succeeded, uh, I don't know, in Sicily, in Naples, the, the, the barons uh increased dramatically in power so much that most of these invasions were actually a negotiation with the, the the barons in the interland that kept maintaining enormous prerogatives and 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 power and and this was in a sense the on the long run the same reason why 
the Italian South, albeit remaining kind of a you know consistent power for, for throughout all the late Middle Ages and early modern age, ultimately failed in the Age of Enlightenment, these reforms, because the nobility had acquired su such a great power that there was no way for these monarchs that were still foreign um, uh, foreign dynasties governing in vice kingdoms that they could centralize at the expense of the local of the local aristocracy, right? So even be careful when you see these lands were conquered, were ruled, were dominated. They wished <laughs> that they had done this, right? And it was always um, actually, you know, a matter of, of balance, meaning that these were some of again of, of the richest and most, you know. Um, had been seat of some of the most powerful entities in medieval Europe, so you couldn't quite. These were not primitive lands that nobody, you know, they could just control without. No, they they always and constantly needed the green light of the local aristocracy. Otherwise, they couldn't do anything. Uh, and um, if you want, the same origins of mafia lay in southern Italy in that context, because. Even though it's something different from what the modern mafia is mostly conceived, that's mostly something that rose with Italian unification. But in a sense, it's a, still a, a relic of such institutionalized mediation between the state, right? In this case, this f foreign rulers and a nobility that simply had to be bought in order to to comply, right? Because otherwise, they're and so, hence, all the corruption and all the, uh, you know, abuse of power and all these things. This is very important to understand the history of that land because, and especially because, uh, as we know, as we have studied, under Norman and Swabian times, actually Sicily, together with England, was the most, the single most centralized and, frankly, mo most juridically advanced kingdom in, in medieval Europe. And so, this tells you. By it gives you by scale the, the dimension of, of the decline and the disruption that occurred. By the way, by the late 13th century, the beginning of the 14th, also there were major, you know, you know, it's all the crisis of medieval Europe, um, stagnation, recession. Um, the and it, and if you want the the creation of these vice kingdoms and the fact that they weren't, you know, even the fact that they were connected still to a greater power like. The, the the ensemble of the Aragonese crown still, however, had these dramatic problems because it couldn't quite centralize. It ha had always to negotiate with the various estates for for politics, the, very differently from Castile. Would make of these kingdoms, such as Sicily, later Naples, also Sardinia, really kind of dependencies, right? In 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 a in a sense, not not much of a colonies. Uh, as such, but let's say there was no strong state building that derived from a from a strong national consciousness. It was always again this foreign dynasty and the local barons, right? It, it's something similar to even what happened if we want to central to certain Central European monarchies that called as external kings to eventually just in order to 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 mitigate their own um, power, but in, in the elective system, so uh, never underestimate this in 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 as much as it, is it, is it, it affected the state building process that we know in in modern countries, right? This is crucial to understand, especially for these lands, and and still, if you want, look at the the independentistic issues with Catalonia today. That there is still that that mentality. That Frank, I, I must be honest with you. I I like the land. I like the the place they like the people, but in in my understanding of the development of of civilization, I think those forces do roll backwards, right? I am not particularly sympathetic towards um, independentism, like for any ism, for that matter. Uh, I, there was a time in which I was a federalist in in, in the first sense, and I still am technically. You know, I I do I do wish that the world would live just by people you know agreeing, but I know very well that this is not the case, and therefore we can't even just um, wait for everybody to you know become enlightened and understanding certain things to to act right. And it's the same reason why certain powers eventually were taken over, and and the same reason for Catalonia. In, within the Spanish state, it, it's the same reason, I don't know, for southern Italy during the 19th century with Italian unification. Um, 
the weaker system loses. There's no way to 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 try to flip the coin because it's uh, it's just moral relativism in historical ignorance and, and much more. It's political illiteracy and strategic, um, uh, even in there, illiteracy at the same time. And yet, of course, there is a value that uh, we have to attribute to these, these experiences as well, because, you know, these lands were still, like, in, in insight, like, we know what happened later, but at the time, of course, even a crown like Aragon was was a pretty successful one, right? It was one of the major powers in Europe, there is no doubt. I mean, in there, it's a lot of lands, a lot of power, especially very con well connected by tr sea trade, maritime contacts. That makes a lot of money, right? Um, the um, Around the 30s of the 13th century um, had been created also for a cadet son of King James I, 1213, 1276, the kingdom of the Balearic Islands, and in 1297, Pope Boniface VIII had granted in fief to James II, also Sardinia. There was a land also that was never, uh, you know, it took a really long time before it was completely pacified because the internal struggles were, were, were fierce, but the Sardinian nobility also didn't dare. Was, was backed by the Genoese, was continuing to rebel. And again, the, the the, the, the Catalans were more kind of maritime oriented, right? So much that in fact, even in in Western Sardinia, you can find areas where, you know, certain cities with sp that speak Spanish fundamentally, but th this has basically nothing to do with the interland that is, it's, it's not even Italian, right? It's another thing. It's properly Sardinian in, 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 in different ways. And that's, that's also a perspective that r rarely get in general, because people are a bit obsessed with this Mediterranean, where are these all these kind of ambiguous commixtions. It's actually, the, the lines are sharply, you know, d marked, right? You know, the, di the division, the differences are very, very neatly drawn. And, and it's a bit of a 19th century socially, you know, Darwinistic idea of this, you know, ethnic promiscuity that we, we often point out for, you know, the, the Mediterranean influences. Yes, the Mediterranean does connect, but uh, the interland is another thing, and still, sea does divide, and never underestimate how much. Actually, and and it would be surprising, in a sense, to, in a way, to realize how much more different Southern Europe is compared to Northern Europe within itself. Uh, because uh, even, of course, these were lands were, you know, much more civilized for for millennia than than, than the North. So there was a much greater cultural development that that does bring to our existence to f to to f to external influences right so never buy into what the the most uh, you know the, the the greatest fashion at least if, you know up to you know in the last day it had been about stressing the you know all these multiculturalistic interpretation of history because frankly that it's not quite the case, and reality is often the reverse of what that dichotomy is often being stressed. Now we are entering another phase of historiography, which is al uh, almost, you know, mirroring the the, mo the complete moral disorientation and trying to, you know, almost taking a uh, fantasy outlook on history, or you know, kind of understanding how much we we can't know or don't know, which is also probably even more dangerous in, in a sense than what it seems. Um, in any case, if you look at the, the broader map of the crowns of Aragon, you see at the beginning of the 14th century how, um, in fact, the Aragonese king controlled directly or through sovereigns uh, that, you know, that were his relatives at the same time, all the great western Mediterranean islands. Mm -hmm. So the papal assignation of Sardinia to the King of Aragon, uh, while Corsica stayed under the Genoese domination. In fact, some maps, even one I used here, shows Corsica in the hands of the Genoese. Yeah, in theory, at some uh, of the excuse me of the of the Aragonese, in, but in theory they claimed that, but they never had it. Right, um, Corsica remained Genoese up to was bought by the French uh, much later. Um, 
well this this event naturally and the the the, the breaking through of you know the the Aragonese uh, invasion of Sicily and the interference in Sardinia and with the, in, in the Tyrrhenian Sea in general brought unavoidably um, to the end of the what had been generally also positive uh, connections the intent between Aragon and Genoa. Genoa, as you know, was uh, after Venice the most important of the Italian maritime republics. It was very well connected with the world Mediterranean had was essentially the greatest now power at that point um, and they were gradually ousted fundamentally by, by Aragon right uh, and so they even if the Aragonese attempted only starting from 1323 to 1325 to affirm directly uh, the the their dominion on on the on Sardinia the Genoese had already entered in in competition with them on the markets and during it, it would take a long struggle that so the alliance of Aragon and Venice against Genoa, because of course the Venetians wanted to maintain the exclusivity on the eastern traffics, Genoa would maintain important colonies, as you know, in the Aegean Sea, in Crimea, in 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 Turkey, and so on. Um, but um, the, so it, it, these were times in 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 maritime history where you couldn't really take out a naval power right there, there was no way that would be reached in just in Victorian times right having a, a navy that is able to prevent another navy to to even enter a certain sea so there was always some degree of you know there was a breakthrough always a trip through these uh, patrolling systems that the Venetians and the Genoese had pioneered themselves in order to to compete against each other uh, on the main trade routes but during the 14th century, after the final defeat of, of, of Genoa against Venice, uh, the Genoese realized that, you know, they had to invest in, in, in the Atlantic route rather than in, in insisting in Mediterranean struggle. And that's also the reason why, in fact, they, install, they st installed themselves in Castilla and Sevilla, because the Castilians also were, of course, in competition with Aragon, opening the Atlantic route, uh, Many of the eventually the age of exploration was, you know, su subsidized by Portugal, by by Castilla, and so on. But the the navies were, you know, the sailors, the crews, the armor were mostly Italian and Genoese, specifically. The same goes for the French. At this point, as we've seen, where uh, Genoa was allied with the Angevins, with with the King of France. Look at the Battle of Zierikse, um against the Flemish. That's where basically French navy was was Genoese as well. So these were the, these republics were the only ones that could feel that much in terms of power. Ironically, Genoa would become the, the banker of of, um, of of Spain later on, and so also of Aragon. Let's say after the the failure, the bankruptcy of the Fuga in in the 16th century, the, with the Bank of Saint George and so on. And so it's not that you know these powers were taken out, but let's say Aragon acquired an hegemonic position in Western Mediterranean that Genoa at some point couldn't really contrast right without losing too much and so they opened this other Atlantic route that that paved the road actually to the age of it of, of the explorations across the African co uh, along the African coast etc um, and uh, the same Columbus was with Genoese and so on but with important connections also with Aragon there is all a uh, deep scientific cartographic mathematical accounting banking culture that develops between Barcelona, Genoa, Pisa, etc. In these times, uh, all the great cartographers came from these lands. At the time, it, we have the first properly modern cartography developing here, um, and it was a very blended world. That is to say, these, uh, in spite of the hostilities between their own polities, the merchants kept traveling, kept um, selling on the various markets. They knew it was risky, but it was still, you know, that there is always a risk. It was calculated, so. What the Aragonese created in in Western Mediterranean was one of the most florid um, cradles of, you know, even of properly of modern state building in, in a way, um, at least considering certain, uh, as we see, not much from a political institutional point of view, but properly from you know the, the men and minds and and techniques and uh, and capa and skills that were that were pioneered and developed further in this context, right?
and um, there is also another element that stemmed from another agent, the stamped actor, the stamped from from the crown of Aragon, its lands, that also manifests how autonomous that political culture was in many ways, as in 1311 some Catalan mercenaries, the Almogavares, conquered one of the fees created in the in the first uh, in, in the previous century in Greece by the Knights of the Fourth Crusade, that is the Duchy of Athens, that up to that point had belonged to the Bren family that had hired the same mercenary, um, the, the same Catalan mercenaries, and eventually had, had rebelled and defeated him and his French knights at the Battle of Cephisus. That is one of the great uh, infantry victories against heavy cavalry of, of the early 14th century. Um, these mercenaries had been veterans of the Wars of the Vespers in Sicily. Uh, many of them were also hired, paradoxically, also by the same Angevins that had fought against them. So it w uh, this tells you, as I was saying, how free, like how boundless these relations were, like how Aragon, after all, profited uh, profited from from just having their subjects around making money, even as mercenaries, and not even caring whether, you know, those were, for example, employed against the same, the same Aragonese sometimes, or the same Ghibelline struggle, right, that, that's important in a broader picture, but it, it was an entrepreneurial way of coping with the situation, also infiltrating, um, the Aragonese had an excellent spying net, we, we are very, we owe much to the collection that Finca made of, with the Acta Aragonensia, that basically are this list, of all the, I mean all of the, of course, but what survived, but we're very lucky, of, of all the uh, inform informations that the various um, agents working for Aragon, and sometimes it were Genoese, and there were other people, um, had in Italy about whatever was going on, like of, of every single one of the tens and tens of Italian uh, city-states, the Aragonese were informed of who were the, the most powerful uh, you know, figures in the city, what they were doing, whatever, because they work, that reveals how dramatically involved in, in that political game they were themselves, right? Um, eventually, the, the Catalans were taken, a, you know, the Catalan mercenaries in Italy disappear almost suddenly from from the tents of, of the mid tens of the 14th century, uh, especially after the 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 Angevin defeat, uh, uh, the Angevin Florentine defeat of Montecatini, because they said, you know, we don't want your Aragonese anymore as mercenaries, they, they're good for nothing. O objectively, they're taken over completely by the French and the Germans. So, there is even, I made, I, I talked about this in the video about Roger de Flore, um, explaining how sometimes we tribute, you know, we, we give credit to, to certain tactical specialties like the um, Amagold virus but mostly light infantry, right, and light cavalry and so on. In certain contexts, as such the one of Cephisus against the the, the enemy, but we we don't look at the bigger picture of, of their structural employment and therefore we create we almost create some mythologies about them. The same Aragonese when they fought, uh such as at the Battle of Luca Cisterna when they stripped Sardinia of to, to the peasants that formerly controlled it. They mostly fought like a you know, a Frankish army, fundamentally, you know, a feudal army without too many, too many light elements, right? So it's interesting to see how, yes, we say cattle and we say Aragonese, but what do we actually mean at the end of the day? That's a very fascinating. I've begun to translate uh, cattle and uh, letters um, from that time, this uh, diplomatic, um, diplomatic documents, because they are... I mean, they, they are necessary to study the military history of the time, but they reveal you so much even about this kind of almost uh, uncontrolled system that still made the, the crown of Aragon profiting from. Uh, now, what happened with the Duchy of Athens, because, you know, th this company was eventually um, hired by the Byzantines that went to fight on with the with, against the Turks in Anatolia, they established the, this this duchy, and they that that was offered in fact in fifth to the king of of Aragon, right? It was kind of a national pride, and even in there it was kind of symbolic. Yes, you know the the king of Aragon had the fifth, but as we've seen, 
how viable was it, right, for, for a positive policy. It was important, right? It was a thorn in the side for, for other rulers, but at the end of the day, first of all, it declined later on, but still it was more a way of saying, yes, we are Catalan, and we hand our duchy in, in fief, let's say, formally to the to the king, but what kind of richer capacity was there to, to actually make a, a grand policy in the Mediterranean about coordinating, it, it was very difficult to even have a control as we've seen on, on all these various entities. Um, but it, it is important that either directly or indirectly the 14th century Mediterranean was heavily um, you know, influenced by by the, uh, the Aragonese monarchy through these parallel kingdoms such as Trinacria, that is Sicily, and the Balearic Islands that um, came back, however, to the Aragonese crown in uh, 1344, or vassals, because that was the, the other thing. In fact, we often underestimate how strong Catalan influence was in southern France, right? Especially with, with Aragonese power, the economy of the Catalan markets could expand considerably, um, and this would, as we've seen, a damage for other maritime cities, as we've seen Genoa and Pisa, but also uh, other, you know, the southern French uh, cities, for example, Montpellier, that was um, subjected for a, for a while to the kings of Aragon, and that uh, also had emerged as a p possible competitor, right, ever since the French had uh, conquered Occitania for good, uh, there was um, a broader issue of, uh, you know, trying to even have a Mediterranean policy, and it was difficult f in, at that point, especially with the contraction of French power f with the start of the Hundred Years' War, to maintain those routes even open, right? There would be a, a sharp decline in part because of Aragonese expansion of, of the Rhone Valley trade, because Genoa, that was the, the main and Pisa that had been defeated by Genoa and kind of become part of the Genoese um, trail, let's say, uh, were, were kind of ousted in the process by the Aragonese in the area, and or, however, they, they, they hadn't the, the complete free hand they had enjoyed before. Um, and so they, op they preferred to open the Atlantic route, right? E as we, and, and so this made the Rhine, uh, the, the, the Rhone, trade decline. Uh, the Venetians too opened mostly the uh, continental route with Germany and the, the various English chevauchés in southern France kind of made the, the economy a bit collapse. So in that sense Aragon was very yet advantaged by the thing and it, uh, it, it had it had, would keep having a, an important connection with with the with these, uh, you know, with important cities of southern France, and now we're declining in importance, but still could be this uh, uh, avant-garde, let's say, of, of Aragonese projection, the projection of Aragonese power in, in even in places that were close to important centers like Avignon, and the Papas, and so on, so to interfere with the impo even important communication systems. In any case, we will keep talking about these powers more in detail. We haven't done very much, honestly, as for the variant history. We, we made less videos than others, but I'm trying to to rebalance a bit the whole thing, and we will surely keep talking about this because it's very it's very interesting. Now, for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.